بسم الله It's recording now إني وجحت وجه لله فاتر السماوات والأرض وما أنا من المشركين إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على تعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لسان يفكه قول أمني رب <تصفيق> The discussion today is about the genders, men and women, God, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and money. If you remember in the hadith that we studied about the women, the 11 women that were complaining, money was raised many times, either in the positive sense or in the negative sense. And in this sense, the issue of rizq and mal and the differences of the approach to wealth between male and female is going to be understood and not only the differences between the male and the female in regards to their approach to rizq is going to be understood but then finally inshallah understanding the ayah and some of the things that go around in this ayah, that men are the caretakers of women and why. So, as a very basic introduction uh, in the Qur'an to the issue of rizq and man's attitude towards it, I just want to start with one paragraph here. This is an article, it's a very interesting article that was published in Psychology Today. It's called Men, Women and Money. Money is never just money. And also, in terms of the lughvi meaning, mal, the word mal, which means wealth, it comes from mala yumilu. It means to what the heart is inclined, to the thing that the mal huna, this Urdu me kate, mal. Mal is that to which the heart is inclined. If the heart is inclined, it has value. If the hearts are inclined, it has bartering value, for example. So, to that which the heart is inclined. Now because men and women are different, they're inclined to different things. So this issue of how men and women treat the issue of money differently, and then why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the men responsible for taking care of the women, this issue will be looked at, and I don't think it will be completed today, because I have much to say on this issue. And so we will first start with Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> talks about and see, think of this. Why Ayatul Dain? You know the longest ayah of the Quran is the Ayatul Dain, the ayah of debt. It proceeds, right after it proceeds the ayat that were revealed to the Prophet in Mi'raj. So you have Ayatul Dain, two ayahs about the debt. Then you have لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِن تُبْدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوا يُحَاسِكُمْ بِاللَّهِ فَيَغْفِرُوا لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ كَبِيرٌ Then, right after this is the ayat revealed in Mi'raj to the Prophet So the most you can say آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَا حَدٍ مِنْ رُسُلِ وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ To the end of Sultan Baqarah. The point here is, what does economics, the ayah of debt, the longest ayah of the Qur'an, on the one side, 
And the ayah revealed in the above the heavens on the other side that has to do with imaniyat. It has to do with your iman. Okay? And the attitude of iman. Uh, the attitude of iman and the ayat, the one, of, one of the most profound ayat in the Quran regarding iman and the ayat regarding economics, basic economics, put together. What is their relationship? This is the question. So this question is answered in the beginning of this article. So Allah, uh, so he says, money is never money. I'm reading partial parts of this. The article is called Men, Women and Money. And I think I, uh, it was published in Psychology Today. And uh, I don't have the author's name right now, but I will get that inshallah. Money is a loaded symbol that to unload it, uh, money is a loaded symbol and a symbol that to unload it, I believe must be unloaded to live in a fully rational, balanced relationship, etc, etc. Money reaches deep into the human psyche. Money reaches deep into the earth. Psyche, because how you see money expresses how you see the world around you. As we will see, we will see this in some detail, inshallah, today if we get a chance. Usually, when the button of money is pressed, deeper issues emerge that have long been neglected. When the issue of money is pressed, behind anybody's idea of money, whether let me just jump forward here. Whether somebody is a hoarder, he likes to gather money. Or he is a spender, he likes to spend money to emotionally satisfy himself. Or whether, a, whatever relationship a person has with money, it tells you something about his view of the world, how he sees the world operating. You get it? Okay. So, usually when the button of money, see, another way to understand this, what is the number one cause of divorce? Money. Why? Because there are deep psychological issues associated with it. And in fact, if you read Sutta Nisa, you know, the definition of maturity, one of the definitions of maturity given in Sutta Nisa is what? I will go here very quickly and I will share with you. The definition of maturity is Allah says, Uh, let me just get to the point, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you have the money of the orphan, when you have the money of your, the guardian of the orphan, don't hand over the money to the orphan until they reach what? Until they reach maturity. What is the definition of maturity? That they can manage money. When you can learn to manage money, that is the age where a person is no longer weak-minded, he is a mature person. By that definition, 90% of this country is immature. Because people in this country don't know how to manage money. Where is that ayah? وَلَا يُؤْتُوا الصُّفَهَا أَمْوَالَكُمْ الَّتِي جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ فِيهَا لَكُمْ قِيَامًا وَارْزُقُوهُمْ فِيهَا وَاكْسُوهُمْ وَقُولُوا لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا وَلَا تُؤْتُوا الصُّفَهَا أَمْوَالَهُمْ Don't give the weak-minded their money. Because they're weak-minded, they're small yet. Right? But what do you do? أَمْوَالَكُمْ الَّتِي جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ uh, that money that Allah has made you, uh, you over there is over here is for the orphans you are the caretakers of their orphans okay provide for them clothe them and say a good word to them okay okay Test them until they reach the age of nikah. Okay? فَإِنْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْدًا If you find in them maturity, right? فَذُرُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Then go ahead and give them their money. 
ولا تأكلوها إسرافا ولا بدارا. and this subject continues. but the point is the the maturity of a person, as defined in the Quran in these ayat, is a person being able to manage their money. The inability to manage money shows that a person has a certain psychological outlook that is not balanced, in which he's not able to function. <coughs> no matter how smart you are, but if you are super smart, you have a PhD, right? But your credit card debt is upon, like you're super using the money and not able to manage your money. That shows that there is something deep rooted psychologically that uh, may need uh, some adjusting. So, this is the second point. The first point was about the relationship between ayat al Dain and the ayat of Imaniyat that proceed from there. Second point was that the definition of maturity within Quran is the ability to manage what? Money. One of the things that we don't teach our children is to how to manage money. In fact, Islamic schools should teach their children how to manage money. This is, a, this is part of growing up, right? And uh, so anyway, uh, so now I'm coming to the third part of my discussion. That there is the, there is the human view of how money is, which we will come to in, in a second. But above that is the, Allah's view of, uh, of, of how we should see money. So Allah says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانِ As for the man, إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests a human, and He honors him, He honors him with risk, high position, money, so on and so forth, فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا so he says, Allah has he is he's been very generous with me, very good with me. Right? And when Allah tests him, then he restricts. Over here, qadara means naqasa. Qadara here means naqasa. Qadara, he restricts. He limits his risk. Then he says, My Lord had disgraced me. Why this happens is now in the next ayah. This is the part that is very interesting. Kalla. Why this is happening? Kalla. No, never. This attitude of yours is because You don't respect the orphans. Because the people that are less than you, you're after kirama. You know kirama. I want to be honored. You, you, everyone can respect the people higher than them. Everyone can respect people more honorable than them. Or equal to you. But it's hard to respect the people less than you. The only reason a person will respect somebody less than you is you feel that they're a test for you from Allah, or you feel that they're a pious person, or you, right? You have some moral morality attached to it. So Allah says, you have this attitude of saying, my Lord has disgraced me. Why? You are people who don't honor the orphans who are less than you. Then what? And you do not encourage the feeding of the miskin. And you want to eat the inheritance just like that. The other meaning of this is uh, you want to get uh, money without any effort. Okay. And then you love money so severely. Then Allah continues. But the point is, just keep this paradigm that Allah gave. Those people who say, I, was, I, I love Allah because He's honored me. But when Allah takes from them, they say Allah has, dis they feel disappointed in Allah. They feel neglected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why this happens? Because they're of their inability to respect the people less than them. So this basic point about the Islamic view of rizq has to be kept in mind. Okay, so now, and then the other thing that I want to share with you is, uh, is very interesting. And this is the, so this is one aspect of Sutul al Fajr talks about the human psyche, the human mind in relationship to how he Views. For example, there are people who look at money and then say, oh, he's less than me, right? Or he's bigger than me, or he's less than me. 
There are other people, depending upon how their spending personalities, which we will talk about. And then I also talked about the definition of maturity is the one who can manage money. Okay. Meaning if Allah... You know, everybody can live a king. Everyone generally can live like a king if you live within your budget. <laughs> You're a king. Right? If you live within your budget, you'll be a king. And you know how much time human beings spend worrying about money? We're going to look at that. How much time... Even if you have money, then your problem is you're worried about money. You know. How you so, spend it? Not how, but just money problems. This is... Inshallah, we will cover this. But specifically what I want to get... I'm not talking about economics, Islamic economics. My purpose is to talk about the difference between men and women in regards to money. But basically I'm giving an introduction right now in regards to the concept of rizq in Islam. So the second point that I want to mention regarding the human... From the human psyche, Allah gave this picture that man feels honored when money comes to him, disappointed when money doesn't come to him. And the, purpose, the reason behind that is we don't honor the people less than us. Then now from Allah's perspective, so this was from looking at the human psyche. Now this is from Allah's perspective. Allah says, let me give you an introduction to Surah Shura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah very profoundly, look, and in fact, uh, maybe I will go into some detail. It, we will cover this in one or two lectures. It won't be all done today. But Allah says, look, I'm making a call. Respond to my call. Okay? I want you all to become one brotherhood. Because who made one brotherhood? Prophet Muhammad made one brotherhood, right? Black and white becomes equal. The rich and poor becomes equal. All humanity becomes one. This is the call of Surah Shura. And Allah says the most important word used in the Surah five times. فَاسْتَجِيبُ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Answer the call of Allah and His Messenger. Okay. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people that respond to this call. They're poor people. They don't have money. They don't have resources. And so Allah is telling them that don't worry about it. I'm behind you. So Allah says this now. Uh, Allah says, Allah is the one who accepts the tawbah from the people and He overlooks the evil deeds that have been done. And He knows completely what you're doing. And, and Allah will, now Allah says, He will answer. Just as before in this surah, Allah was asking the believers to answer. Now Allah says, You think you have no resources? I am the one, I'm going to respond to my servants and I'm going to increase their risk. I'm going to increase their fadl and their, you know, the, the bounties. I'm going to increase it for them. And for the disbelievers, this is painful punishment. But then Allah says, look, I'm going to increase my fadl upon you. And if you want to understand this word fadl, in the context of the seerah of the Prophet, the best surah to understand that is Surah Al-Fatr. Because over there Allah says, you know, Allah makes the promises of, 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 of uh, maghanima kathiratan and so on and so forth. Allah makes these promises. لَوْ بَسَتَ اللَّهُ رِزْقَ لِإِبَادِهِ But Allah says, if I gave you a blank check, of risk, just take as much as you want. I'm going to give you, but not blank check. So Allah says, There would be bagha, rebellion in the world. Human beings rebelling against one another. But He sends down risk by qadr, restricting. He will give you, but a little bit, you know. Not too much all of a sudden, but He will give you. In portion. <laughs> Indeed, he is all knowing and he's watching you. He will always give you enough. Just, you know, this happens in human life. Right when you think everything is going to just end, right? But what happens when things come to that point? You just find that there are different options at that point, right? Just, there are different options. Business is not working, well now business is coming down and now there are going to be different options. Yeah. So Allah always opens up different options. Khabirun <laughs> basir. And then now, now notice how Allah mentions this example now. هُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ مَا قَنَرْتُ 
وَيَنْجُرُ رَحْمَتُهُ Allah is the one who sends down the rain. Right when the farmer is thinking, Bas, there's no rain coming this season, it looks... Right? مَا قَنَاتُ وَيَنْجُرُ رَحْمَتُهُ وَهُوَ الْوَلِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ Just as the rain comes at the last minute, you weren't expecting it. And you were thinking the whole harvest would go away, but just at the last minute, the rain comes. Well, and then, uh, then Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِي خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَثَّ فِيهِمَا مِنْ دَابَ وَهُوَ عَلَى جَمْعِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءُ قَدِيرٌ This point is related to another point, but I'm just going to translate here. And amongst His sign is that in His is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and whatever is the animals of the heavens and the earth. And he can bring them together if he wills. Then he says, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Whatever difficulty falls upon you, it is because of what your own hands have earned. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ And he forgives much. You know what it means? You should have been in more trouble. That's what it means. You should have been in more trouble. This musibah of dunya that you find. Allah says, you should have been, actually, if you want to be fair, you should have been in more musibah, but, kathir, but he forgives uh, so much. And then the ayat continue. But here is another portion of the Quran that's talking about risk, just the general outlook of the issue of risk. Okay, now, so let's just continue with this article, inshallah, at this point, and we will come back to some of the ayat in the Quran. So money is, reaches deep into the human psyche, usually when the button of money is pressed, deeper issues emerge that have long been neglected. How you spend money, whether you save money, you hoard money, you amass money, whether you spend money, how much of an emotional, because of your emotional, uh, you can say emptiness, you spend money, right? All of this is related to your world, how you see the world, right? And so money is really a, a very basic entity in which you can tell a person's, not only maturity, but you can tell a person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can also tell that how balanced their relationship is with the world. See, after all, everyone has to answer the question, why am I a poor man? Why am I poor? It all goes back to Allah. Right? This balance between the qadr of Allah and your ambition. The qadr of Allah and your ambition, this balance. And there is no way to have a balance between these two, except that you bring Allah in the picture. Either you're going to say, I want to be super ambitious, but the qadr of Allah is not going to let you. And then you're going to be struggling and you're going to be sad and depressed and just nothing is happening. So, you know, or you just become one of those people that say, this is my qadr and then you lose your ambition. Again, this is an, a, uh, a, a disharmony of a proper relationship with the rizq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, why then this will happen? And you know, in fact, Alama Iqbal in his uh, poetry, uh, in his own philosophical way, uh, you've heard of Muhammad Iqbal? Of oh, okay, okay. So, you know, he in his own philosophical poetry, he says, just to give you an example, he says that if, you know, the people that blame Qadr, the word he uses in his poetry is uh, um, Kismat. I think that's the word. Uh, kismat, my Kismat, my destiny. Kismat. What can I do? You know, and, and he says, the people who do this, my kismat, my kismat, my destiny, my destiny, these are the people who become slaves. Right? In, in, in his understanding, I'm not saying this is the Islamic concept of qadr. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, he's, but he has a valid point, which is that some people blame everything on their destiny. And they don't make any effort. So, the point is, money determines the balance between, it, it cre either creates harmony or disharmony between you and the world, you and God, your disappointments with God. A human being's disappointments with God are because of rizq. A, a human being's what? Disappointments with Allah are because of rizq. He didn't do what I wanted, he didn't give me what I wanted. So over there where there should be taslim, accepting the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the one side, but on the other side there, though, there is the disharmony, oh it's my... It's my qadr, I can't do anything. This is also a disharmony. So 
then how this interplays in a, in a male-female relationship. This is really where we want to understand this. So, uh, so money is very much interrelated with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very much related with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one way I can give this example, I don't know if I've given it here before, but there's um, a book written about this. It's called uh, The Red Car Theory. Have I talked about it here? No? Okay. You know, uh, somebody who decides to buy a red car all of a sudden sees red cars everywhere. Right? He was thinking, I'm going to buy a red car, and nobody has red car, or people don't have red cars, and all of a sudden he's thinking about red cars, and all he sees is red cars. Why? It's the same thing. If you view the world negatively, all you will see around you is Negative. negativity. And if you, if you view, view the world positively, alhamdulillah, right? Then you will see the, positive. you will be able to see the positive. So it totally depends upon how you see the world. And then, when you see the world positively, that actually opens up more doors. Because you're more ambitious, more motivated, you see more opportunities. But if you see the world negatively, like Allah is giving you nothing, Allah, you, Allah has disappointed you, then, then you what? You, you don't want to even give the orphan some money because you feel like somehow, you know, you're being, un, you're being unfairly treated by God. Or, if you don't believe in God, fate has unfairly treated you. Destiny has unfairly treated you. And so, it has deep re repercussions how you see money, how you spend money, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, he says then, uh, as a result, money matters are a perfect vehicle for awareness and growth. The issue of money will, and you know what zakat means? Exactly this point. Zakat means to grow. Zakat means to grow, cultivate. There are two meanings. Zakat means to purify, Zakat also means to cultivate, to grow. Right? So when you are spending money in the cause of Allah, for those very people that are less than you, you're actually opening doors of awareness and growth. This person doesn't realize how some of his statements are actually very in line with the Quranic uh, view. And then he says, uh, Couples discuss many things before marriage, but the meaning of money is not one of them. So one thing, Muslim, Muslim schools... Uh, couples before they get married, they should definitely discuss their view of money, as you will see, because this is becoming more and more a bigger gap. You know, there are those people who want to amass money because they want to live in a certain cause, right? Uh, I, I want to live for Islam, so then, but if, if he's going to marry somebody or she's going to marry somebody who wants to, uh, who sees money as for other whether as a spender or as an amasser or gatherer, uh, then there will be some conflicts there. But we will come to that in a second. If opposites don't attract right off the bat, his point is statistically, when people get married, they usually have very different money personalities. Uh, one is, and this becomes by force, because if one spouse is spending more, then automatically the other one has to become the one that's going to put on the brakes. If one is putting on the brakes, the other one will want to spend more. So whatever personalities are, they become, they, they end up becoming opposites. Okay, so if opposites don't attract right off the bat, they will create each other eventually. This is what happens in regards to money within relationships. So if the, if the a wife, and generally this may be true, I don't know, uh, we will look at the statistics on this actually. Uh, but if the w wife is spending more, then the husband will automatically become more conscientious, right? And he will become money worry. He will go into a phase of being worried about money, uh, or he'll have an anxiety about money. And so, generally, they become to opposite ends. And so, we'll study the different personalities. The fact remains that people do not grow up with educational or philosophical con or do not grow up with educational or philosophical conversations about what money is and what money is not. If we're not overspending, we're typically worrying about money or compulsively hoarding it. So if we're not spend if you're a spender, then you're going to be one of those people who doesn't even want to hear if it went over the checking account, or over the budget, or it was less than the budget, you don't want to hear, 
you, if, if you like to spend a lot, you're, you're, you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be the type of person who's going to go back and check how much you spent. That's how the spender is. The spender spender spends without worrying about the consequences of his spending. And the opposite of that is the person who's worried. Okay, he's worried. He has anxiety about money. And so this is how Allah tests us. We become opposites. Husband is one way. The wife is the other way, or if the wife is one way, the husband becomes the other way. One is worrying about money, the other wants to spend money, or something of this nature, right? So if we're not overspending, we're typically worrying about money or compulsively hoarding it. And particularly, uh, there's also a difference between ages. As we get older, you begin to hoard more money. Al-hakum al takathu you know, in your uh, trying to get more and more and more, Right? And by, by hoarding money, what happens? See, whether you're spending money or hoarding money, what is the, what is the aspect of money that Allah is saying from a psychological? Because every Quranic verse, every Quranic surah can be looked at from a hundred different angles, from an economic perspective, from a psychological perspective, from a different perspectives. So, from the perspective of psychology, what is this ayah saying? Al-Hakumut-Takathur, by, by, you know, the same thing Allah mentions in When they count their money because they're hoarding it. This hoarding is really disliked. Right? And Israf is spending. In, the, uh, in, in uh, what does it say? Uh, and mubazirin, inna mubazirin kana ikhwan shayatin. Those that want to extravagantly spend are mubazirin, and those people that want to hoard, right? So wa yuli kulli humada tilumada aladi jamaa ma lahu adada yahsabu anna ma lahu akhlada. He thinks his money will remain with him forever. Why? Because whether he's amassing the money or he's spending the money, the money has an emotional attachment. It has an emotional, like if I buy a car, you know, and there are things that guys tend to spend more in, and there are other things women tend to spend more in. We're going to get into all of that. Like for example, men tend to spend more in electronics because of their nature. Okay, they'll spend more in electronics. The point being is that as a person gets older, he will, he, when he sees things around him, those things that he's bought are not just items, they have an emotional appeal. And they make him feel alive. As long as my things are with me, I'm fine. Right? As, as long as the world I've created around me is there, I'm there. Right? This, this kind of like... And when they sell things on advertisement, by the way, one thing about advertisement, they never sell a product. They sell the emotion behind the product. You know, if they're selling a car and they have a beautiful girl inside, right? or they're showing how fast it goes, they're selling an emotion. The whole point is, in fact there are books on this, that when you sell a product, you don't sell the product. You have to add, the, you have to bring the emotion out first, then introduce the product, and then make the sales pitch. And so you bring out the emotions first, then introduce, the, so even when, uh, it's just like uh, spending and food and all of these things are interrelated. When people like, for example, they're depressed, they'll eat more or they'll uh, not eat at all, right? The same as the hoard, the person who's hoarding the money, trying to amass the money. He's like the person who's not eating it, uh, eating food. The one who's spending is like the one who's eating to get, eating a lot to get rid of their depression. So all of these things are interrelated. So uh, if we're not overspending, we're typically worrying about money or compulsively hoarding it. And what happens you, when you hoard the money, right? Why a person counts his money over and over again, you think? He wants to jama'a his money and he wants to count it. Why? Because he feels in control. When he counts his money, when he counts his money and it is, oh, I, I, I'm in control. Right? I'm in control. This is, this is the, yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the right way in Surah al Right. Yes, yes, yes. This is in Sutra, right? Yes. So uh, then, 
<coughs> so, then let me come over here. So what happens? Uh, he's giving an example in this. My father, affected by depression, worried out loud about money. So some people, they worry about money out loud. Okay? And then the mother, who was the opposite. So he's worrying, so therefore he's trying to amass the wealth. He's trying to stay in control. Okay? And my mother was a shopaholic, expressing love by buying me and herself clothes. Now, one thing I want to share with you uh, very quickly is the difference between some of the... Uh, I'm coming to the differences between the male and the female in spending. But let me just read this very quickly. This has been, this is a statement by a, his name is Ruth Hayden, a financial counselor and author of For Richer, For Richerer, Not Poorer, The Money Book for Couples. So he says, women have been taught to invest in lifestyle and children. Women invest in what? Lifestyle, lifestyle and children. children. Men have been taught to invest in things that hold value. A horse, a house, retirement, etc, etc. So guys want to buy things that will have value and another, or function, some sort of function, like computer or something. But wife will be interested in, oh, Eid is coming, let me buy my niece this. And Eid is coming, let me buy my such and such this. Right? So the men are like hunters, they go and grab the, the valuable things. They hunt down the valuable things. And women are gatherers. They like to share things. They like to buy gifts for people. And, and, and you'll see there are other differences, but this is one of them. Even the approach to shopping differs greatly. Consider the innocent tr trip to the mall. She will dive into clothes. This is a statement. She will dive into clo clothes racks, seeking an outfit she likes. One that expresses her view of herself, something in fashion, okay, something now. He will make a beeline to, he, he, will, he will find the first shirt that is doable, he will pick it up and go to the counter to pay, pay the money, okay. With the first shirt that will work, then he will stand with the bag in hand, tapping his toe and turning, thumbing uh, thumbing about with what he perceives as her inability to make a decision. So, see, he, he, the guy went to the mall and he wanted a shirt. So the first shirt he found that's functional as a shirt, he picked it up, took it to the counter. He comes to his wife, she's still shopping, and she's looking through hundreds of clothes. The way the male reads that is she can't make any decisions. But the reality is, is that she's just, that's how they are. They like the experience and the process of, of buying. Okay, and then uh, another very important, women are collectors of stuff. This is why if you buy a house, women will decorate it, buy all the things for it. This is what they do, okay? Women are collectors of stuff. Women do clothes. They're taught that what they need to get, what they need to get through life is approval. They have to look good, act good, be good, and collect things around them that will enhance a good house, good self, good you know clothes, this, because they're taught they have to get the approval of others. Then, when men go shopping, they expect that whatever they're shopping for is basically get something fixed attitude. If I need a computer, it's because I have a problem that needs to be fixed. Guys are the fixers. They buy things based upon fixing things, whether it's a retirement per, uh, plan or it is whatever. Uh, they look at things, what am I fixing? Right? I, and what am I fixing if I'm buying this? This is the male attitude towards money. So then he says, because men are supposed to fix stuff. They don't want to be part of the process. They don't want to be part of the experience of buying things. They want to... Whatever is the problem, let me fix it. This is the male attitude. Also, very important, the Journal of Financial Planning says, our sense of who we are, this is about the worldview. I was talking about how we see the world, how money and that is related. He says, it says in the Journal of Financial Planning, our sense of who we are is intricately 
inter intertwined with our spending habits. According to the study by um, this person who's a professor of consumer economics and personal uh, and so on and so forth. So our sense of who we are is intricately related to our spending habits. If a person believes in Allah, he will spend differently from the person who doesn't believe in Allah. If a person, he is too attached to dunya, he will spend differently from the person who is not attached to the dunya. A male will spend differently than how a female will spend. So just, these are like some ways to look at this issue. How much time do we have? Fifteen? Okay, good. So let me just read this very quickly. Uh, so, couples polarized over money engage in a balancing act of opposites. And he continues, this is a little bit technical, I won't go into this. Oh, spenders means the ones that are spending. Okay, so two spenders, so she's a spender and he's a spender. What happens? Two spenders who come together will fight each other over the super spender. Who's more of a spender? Okay. The other role as a defense will learn to hoard because someone has to set limits. So this is what happens in a relationship. And see, this has to do with your deep psyche because when you're in a relationship, and let's say she's spending a lot, right? And it's against what you have trained your mind to do, which is to put things in control. Well, this is one of the reasons why money is the number one breaker of marriage. Because you, you, you clash with somebody else's worldview. But what tends to happen is when people get married, they do align up differently. And uh, so anyway, we'll look at that. A worrier will turn a maid into an avoider, just as a way of escaping from the avalanche of worry. So if one, if one spouse is too worried about money, the other one's just going to become an avoider. She, she doesn't, or he doesn't even want to see how much money is in the balance. Because one's worrying so much, so the other becomes depressed because of that and goes to the other extreme. An avoider will turn a mate into a worrier. Two partners, okay, and then he continues. Hoarders are usually worriers and spenders are usually avoiders, which I already mentioned. Okay? When not spending, a hoarder feels victorious. The one who's hoarding the money. When he's not spending, he feels what? Victorious and in control. When a spender, when not spending, a spender, when he or she's not spending, feels anxious and deprived. You see how much money has a psychological effect? If, if this, the worrier is spending, it's ruining his nights. And if the spender is not spending, it's ruining that person's nights. And what tends to happen in relationships is that you do become kind of opposites. The, the balance should be, the, 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 the best is when they're both balanced. Nor spending, nor uh, hoarding, right? Meaning they're, they're doing what we call, or what he calls a masters. They, they, they are, they're balanced and then they do it for a cause. They invest for a cause and so on and so forth. We will come to that. When a spender, a spender when not spending, feels anxious and deprived, indeed spenders can't tolerate the word, word budget. Okay, and financial planners have to draw up a spending plan. That's what they call it. They don't call it a budget, they'll call it a spending plan. Other money personalities include planners who are detail-oriented and dreamers. That's like people like... Me, okay. I'll tell you in a second. Money personalities in also include personalities like detail-oriented and dreamers, who are global visionaries. Okay. In addition, there are money monks. They're what? Money monks. And, you know, political activists, and they want to spend money for, and they're those people who believe money corrupts, right? Uh, who feel money corrupts, and it's better not to have too much so there are those people who are like, oh, you know, I don't, I could, I can open up another store, but I'm happy with what I have, or I'm happy with the profession I have. I don't need to make more money. There, you can say money monks. They're happy with what they have, and their amassers are, they don't save. Amassers don't. Their intent is not to save, but what they do is they invest 
to they invest to a cause. They save their money so that they can spend it for a certain environmentalist or you're against abortion or you're a Christian who goes to the church and gives 10% of his income. So you are investing, you're amassing the money but to give to a certain cause. So these are different personalities of money. But the point is all of these, they reflect your view of the world, your relationship with God and your relationship with humanity. All of these things, all of these personalities. Then he says, money issues rarely manifest themselves openly in relationships. Instead, couples fight over what money represents. And while money issues can rear their head any time, there are specific transition periods in relationships that force them to surface. Like tax time, when a new baby is going to be born, buying a house, couples may complain. We can't agree on where we want to live. Or... He wants to go on a vacation and I want to save money for retirement. Or she keeps indulging the children, getting them everything they want. I don't think that's good for the kids. So on and so forth. Male and female difference in approaches to money. Men are mostly like hunters and women like gatherers. Okay? And this comes to why Allah made men in charge of spending. I, this is one of the main points I want to come to. Men and women differences in approaches to money. Men, men are like hunters, women are like gatherers. So, for example, uh, they go out, this is about men, again, the similar example given by this person. They go out, buy a shirt, wear it until it dies. This is men. And go out and kill another shirt. Women, on contrast, gather. They shop for their next Eid or Christmas or whatever you want to call it, for their niece, for their son-in-law, and so they're buying gifts, right? They want to connect. Women are connectors. They want to gather people around them. So this is what they do. First, men and women have differences of personal boundaries. Okay, yeah, so this is very important. Women, men tend to have more rigid money personalities than women do. So, a man is usually fixed in the way how he sees money, whereas women can be very much more fluidy in their relationship with money. Sometimes they can give to the poor, but then they may go to the other extreme. They, women can go into all sorts of directions in their relationship with money, whereas men tend to stay pretty much fixed in how they see money and how they relate to money. Okay. Second, men are raised to see the world in a hierarchical, competitive way. There's always one up, one down position. Right? So, there's always somebody who has more than me. There's always somebody who has less than me. Women see the world as a cooperative and, 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 and sharing. In addition, they are, they are allowed, even encouraged, to be needy, vulnerable, while men are discouraged from showing such vulnerability. Now, this is very important. As you will see, the next part of the whole study comes to this point. Men need to show that they are winners. This is a psychological need of a man. He has to financially show that he's a what? He's a winner. And women, because vulnerability, you know what I mean by vulnerability? Showing weakness is the essence of intimacy. Vulnerability is the essence of? Vulnerability. Vulner uh, into, because when you expose yourself, let's say, between husband and wife, vulnerability is to show weakness, you can say, right? And so vulnerability is interrelated with intimacy. And women are more open to being vulnerable. Not just in the sense of, like, uh, in the sense of, uh, they're more open to their own weaknesses, put it that way. In fact, there was a study done, a very important study done, in uh, this research took many, many years. I forget the name of the researcher, but this woman, she did this research and she was studying the subject of vulnerability and shame. This was her 12, 20 year research, I forget how long it was. And she found the women that accept their vulnerability, women that accept their weaknesses. I'm not as physically as strong as a man, or yes, I need the help of my father for this, or yes, I need the help of my husband for this. 
women that accept their vulnerabilities and weaknesses are much happier than women who do not allow themselves to accept their vulnerabilities. So what it means is, by making the man the spender and giving him the psychological fulfillment of his need to feel like a winner, and by putting women in a position of vulnerability so that they can have greater intimacy. You see what I'm trying to say? By putting them in a place of vulnerability, where therefore allowing them to express their vulnerability, their need for their husband, allows the relationship to become much stronger and greater. And it makes no difference to the woman, for example, let me just finish reading this. How much time do I have? Morning will stop for three minutes. Three minutes? Okay. Men, now notice this, men do not see themselves as part of a team. And of course, men and women are raised to believe different things about the way they should actually handle money. Despite many social changes, and it continues, I'm not going to go into that right now. Let me just come into this. Moreover, when men make money, now this is not only this, money tends to make, money tends to make women depressed. Whereas money tends to make men happy. Now this is a research that I'm going to quote to you. When men make money in the stock market, they credit their own selves. When they lose money, they blame the incompetence of their advisors or bad luck. That's not proper too, but the point is, they feel a sense of accomplishment. When women take money in the, make money in the market, they credit the cleverness to their advisors, good luck, or even the stars. And when mo- they lose money, they blame themselves. So a female's relationship with money is, if she makes positive money, she doesn't feel encouraged by it. Even to the point, this, now notice this. When men make more money than their spouse, they believe their superior earning entitles them to greater power in decision making. But in contrast, women who make more money than their mates always desire sharing in decision making. So for the female, making more money no, makes no psychological difference for her. That, that way that should be good news for some brothers. Because they shouldn't feel, oh, uh, they shouldn't use that as a way of feeling I'm inferior. Because it doesn't affect them in that way. Unless somebody wants to get at you and they know you are affected that way. That's a different issue. But generally, men, if they make more, they feel a sense of accomplishment. Money, making money makes a, a man feel accomplished. Bottom line. But making money does not necessarily make a female feel the sense of accomplishment, especially when it has to do with investing. Especially when it has to do with investing. This is also, uh, by the way, one of the reasons women are very good employees. Because they don't credit their talent to the money that they make. They credit their boss for the money that they make. That somebody else has done something good to me. Like my advisor has done good to me. My employer has been nice to me. So therefore I need to be nice back. And you don't find that attitude amongst men. Right? And, and so, anyway, this is a separate issue. So, uh, men are trained to believe that money equals power and that power is the path to respect. I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but money becomes a source of self-respect. And that is what? If you're mature with it. I make this much money, I'm going to live in this much money. As long as I live within the money I make, I'm a king. Right? And whatever risk Allah has written for me, I'm okay with that. And so on and so forth. However, uh, power and... And then then it goes into relationships succeed succeed only when, when there is vulnerabilities. Relationships succeed when partners are willing to show their what? Vulnerabilities. She's willing to share her fears, her sorrows, her weaknesses, her sadness, her disappointments. She's, so this vulnerability, to be in a state of vulnerability creates 
the relationship.